Hey guys, I, I know I already made an externality video, but in that one I only discussed a Pigouvian tax. In this one I want to discuss three different solutions to negative externalities and why two of them are clearly better than the third. So we're starting with this market. There's our demand curve and our supply curve. Uh, there's our equilibrium, it's all there. And I want to introduce an external cost into the market. I'm going to call my external cost just EXC, and I'm going to set it equal to $15. Now, I do have a slightly more complicated one, one that increased in quantity in my other video, uh, but for this, we're just going to keep it constant. Every unit of the good that we produce or that we consume creates an additional $15 of cost on society, uh, costs that are not being considered by the firm. So, uh, let's adapt our supply curve and our demand curve. Don't forget that a supply curve is marginal cost. And then a demand curve is basically marginal benefits for our consumers. This equilibrium point is when we went to the point where our marginal cost equaled our marginal benefits. We captured every transactions where the net benefits were positive. But now we've got this external cost which means there's more cost than the marginal cost and benefits we already considered. So we're going to create a new function called the marginal social cost function, and it's going to be equal to the individual marginal cost, sorry, the market marginal cost plus the external cost. So that means it's going to be equal to 35 plus 2q. I just added 15 to my supply curve, right, to my inverse supply curve right there. So what's that look like on this graph? Well, I've got this marginal social cost line. And the gap between them is the external cost. Let's see, we've got a 35 here. Now, one thing you'll notice is that at our market equilibrium now, the costs to society are greater than the benefits. What are the costs? Well, the marginal social cost is going to be 155. It's $15 higher than the private cost, the marginal cost, and the benefits are still 140. This gap, this externality, is 15. Uh, and so, what does that mean? Well, that means that we've consumed to a point where the costs are greater than the benefits. That means that we are going to start suffering a loss in our market. All of this area in here is area where we're consuming the good and the costs outweigh the benefits. And that is a loss for society, which we call a deadweight loss. So what is the optimal quantity? Well, that's the one where the costs actually equal the benefits. So we said our marginal social cost equal to our marginal benefit. And if we do that, we will get 55. Where did I get that from? I set 35 plus 2q equal to 200 minus q. Solve for q, you get 55. So what happens now? We've got a market that because our suppliers are not considering all of the costs of the, from the good, our market is overproducing. Our optimal quantity what we'll call a Q star is 55, but our market quantity is greater. And so our market is failing. If we leave it by itself, it's creating losses for society that are not necessary. And so I want to introduce three options, three ways that the government can intervene to correct this market failure. Now, our first option that I've already talked about before is to set a Pigouvian tax on your good equal to the external cost at the optimal quantity. Now, in our case, this is easy because the external cost is always 15, but what does this do? Well, a tax on the supply curve has the effect of shifting supply up. And if we shift it up by the level of the external cost, we create a pseudo supply curve, a taxed supply curve, 
that is equal to the marginal social cost curve. By putting a tax on here equal to the externality, we force the firm to internalize their external cost. And then when they do that, the market will be efficient. Now another option is we could do a cap and trade system where the government issues tradable permits uh, and these permits give firms the right to produce the good that's creating the externality. So for instance, I could say 55 permits where each permit allows you to produce one unit of the good or I could issue 11 permits for five units each, or whatever. Issue a number of permits that allows the optimal quantity of production, and then let firms buy them and sell them from each other. The firms who get the most benefit from it can buy it from the firms who get the less benefit, and market forces can allow them to internalize their own externalities again. Our third option, we'll just call regulation. And for the sake of a simple model, I'll just say there's an arbitrary limit capping Q at Q star or at 55. So we're just telling our firms, hey, there's a certain amount you're all allowed to produce and it will add up to that amount. So what might this look like? If I had two firms, which you know that would kind of break the use of the supply and the demand model because it assumes there's lots of firms, but bear with me for a sec. If there's two firms, I could tell them everyone is allowed to produce 27.5 units of the goods, no one is allowed to produce more. Now what we're going to find is that this is actually the least desirable way of doing this. It is a more costly way to fix the externality. And let me explain why for just a minute. So let's look at two different firms on the same graph quantity of their production, marginal benefits to the firm. So this is different than the marginal benefits up here for the demand curve. This is how much the firm benefits from producing its good. And let's look at two different firms. Let's have a marginal benefits for firm one. And let's create a marginal benefit for firm two. So this could be like two firms with different production technologies where each one's benefit in different ways from the quantity of the good that they're making. So what happens then if we implement some arbitrary standard where I say you're not allowed to create more than 27.5 each? Well, this creates a problem in the market because the marginal benefits to firm two are less than the marginal benefits for firm one. If this were like a cap and trade situation, firm one benefits more from another unit of the good, so firm one would buy the right to produce more from firm two. But as it is, they're not allowed to. This policy chooses a level that affects the firms differently, and there is still room in society to make things better off. We could still have 55 units of production, but by allowing them to trade amongst themselves or something to that effect, we could get a situation that's more efficient. So let's return to these three options now. One, two, and three. Let me tell you something. Economists, by and large, prefer one and two over three. Uh, because of this idea of three having this gap here where the marginal benefit for firm one does not equal the marginal benefit for firm two. That's inefficient. Uh, we could make both firms better off by doing some sort of a transfer in between them. So economists by and large prefer these to number three. And if you look, I'll put a link in, in the description, uh, if you look at the economist statement on climate change as one example of an externality, they focus very heavily on this tax idea because it's a simple, easy way 
to correct an externality. So anyway, I hope that's helpful to you guys. If not, too bad. Thanks for watching. Good luck econing. This is fun stuff. At least for me.